They say that action is better than words most of the time. And it is true. What we're going to do is we're going to play some rhythms, and then we're going to talk about the correlation of Ricky and me playing and leaving room for each other, you know. When you see uh, a trap drummer and a percussionist like me, you know, uh, playing together, as long as Ricky and I have been playing, then you will understand that uh, you have to uh, let the other guy breathe and you have to know rhythms, you know, you have to know how to play several instruments in order to uh, get along because, uh, you know, I remember in the beginning uh, when I started playing with uh, uh, drummers, they were all over the place, you know, and they were all arrogant, they were, you know, they, they'd be all over the place, they, they would be playing my part, you know, what, what I was doing here, like this pattern here, they were doing it here, they're going like, you know, and they, uh, they were all over the place, and then slowly, you know, as I started educating and teaching people, things started to change, you know, guys that have been, you know, um, that I have exchanged knowledge with have been um, uh, John Benakovich, whom I was the first drug drummer that I met, uh, that I became very good friends with here in New Orleans. Uh, later on, I met uh, uh, Ricky Sebastian and Herling Riley. Uh, I taught Herling Riley rhythms, not how to play the drums, he was already. Uh, you know, an accomplished drummer, same as Rick, but they learned from me, you know, stuff, you know, how to play in time with, with somebody like me, you know. And uh, uh, it's been going on like that for, for a long time. Rick and I have worked um, mostly together more times than, uh, I think I have played with Ricky more times than I have, than I have with uh, uh, Johnny and, uh, and uh, Burling Riley, I, I played a gig with Burling Riley uh, last year at Snow Harbor, and it was very nice because him and I hadn't played uh, since way back in the 70s or 80s, you know. Uh, let me introduce you to this instrument, you know. Uh, this this instrument right here, they're all called tumba numbers, okay? They're not called congas, congas, or congas. People keep saying congas, no, that's a misnomer. Uh, this is a Cuban instrument. You know, invented in Cuba, it's a modern instrument. This instrument here was invented in the eastern part of Cuba and originally it was called Himawas. Himawas is another word for twins. You know, you can say mellizos in Spanish, you can say gemelos, but Himawa is a, it's a word that the Cubans like to use. Later on, somebody wanted to call them bongos. The Cubans like to use foreign names for things because they think it makes them more interesting. Uh, I don't like that, you know, I don't think it makes... They started calling them bongos, which is a foreign word, it's not a Cuban word, and the word bongos is stuck on it. A lot of times when I say, uh, what do you want me to play, Himawa was on the gig? They, they go like, what? <laughs> you know, and they go, what? I say, you know, bongos, yeah, oh, bongos, yeah, yeah. You know, when you play bongos, uh, you gotta play uh, a hand bell. Where did my son put that bell on? Oh, uh, it might be, look, the big bell? Yeah. It's on the back of that music stand. Right here. Right here. Behind oh. that box. Behind the box? Yep. The bongo player, he plays the bottom bell. On the bridge. Always on the bridge, unless otherwise arranged. But it's always, the, you know, he plays, uh, the, a bongo player has to play uh, the big bell. That thing about the player, originally, uh, was just playing what we call the, the cascara, which means the pill. That's the word that the Cubans like to use in slang for down here in the timbales. You play down here when you're not on the bridge, and when somebody's taking a bass solo or a piano solo, then you play pianissimo. You know, that's when you play down there. You know, it's not. Uh, I'll play the bell whenever I feel like it, or the cymbal going over there. The rules. And these instruments, they are all 100% structurized. It's a language. The solos, the rhythms, everything has to be learned. You know, it's like if you are off chord, you are off chord. It's the same thing. You have to you stay within the structure. And it's a very misunderstood instrument. Uh, most of the people throughout the world, you know, a lot of people they think it's a soul thing. Like you just come and bang on it, you know. And, uh, I play better than you because I got no. It's not like that. You have to learn 
the, uh, the rudiments, you have to learn the, the solos and his language. You know, and we're gonna do it together and I will illustrate, you know, we'll repeat some phrases, you know, and uh, you get the idea, you know. And then I will explain what part of the hand uh, you produce the sound with on the, on the tumba letters and on the bongos. Uh, I wish I had uh, this thing here. Man. What kind of chalk do you use in this? You need some, something to write with? You know, there's a marker, yeah, there's right, a marker right there. Illustrate uh, something so that you guys can see the hand like this and show you what part of the hand you, you, you hit with to get that sound. This in here? Yeah. But can, can this be erased off? Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen that. This, this is a marker and it can be washed off? Oh, it says dry erase. Okay, let's see. I don't want to mess up anything. Can you guys see good enough from over there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to make a perfect uh, drawing of a hand, but it will give you an idea of what I want to illustrate to you guys. Uh, let, this is the hand, right? The sound is going to come with from the two knuckles here. Don't hit here near the uh, the first bending of the finger. It's very painful. You're going to get a blood clot, and it's very painful. Now, the first bend you can hit there. You know, you use that part there to actually play the bongos, and uh, it will not hurt. But the second bend right here, this one here, is very painful. Sometimes I, uh, I get carried away and uh, I hit, you know, everybody makes a mistake and, and it's very painful. You get a callus and you, you get a blood clot. So if I was drawing perfectly, you wouldn't see the line, but let's make believe, you know, that this is okay, the thumb here. too low. Trust me, I can draw better than that, but right now, uh, this is the knuckle here. The knuckle should be close to the edge, more or less right here. You bring it in like this, see? And it doesn't matter, one knuckle hits a little bit more than the other because, you, as you can see, you know, uh, how the hand is built. But that, that's how you get that sound. Uh, you try to avoid not pressing with the rest of the hand. But it doesn't matter if the rest of the hand or the fingers touch a little bit, but that's the sound. And then when you want to muffle it, you press, same as you do on a snare drum, on a tom tom, you know, whatever, when you do a, a, a press. You do the same principle here on this instrument. The tapao, the tapao uses the same principle. The knuckle here on the little finger has to be at, right in there too not below uh, don't bring it below the edge don't do it like that because then you're going to hurt yourself it's got to be a little bit above right there and you just lean on it and then the sound comes from the corner of this finger here mostly at the first bend and a little bit of this finger here it goes like this see? now in theory it's, it sounds very simple but in reality to get that sound, it's going to be, it's going to take you a long time. It takes a long time. On the bongos, you use the first bend of the finger, this finger right here, and this finger right here of muscle. But sometimes when you play loud and you don't have much amplification, you can use the two fingers together. But you're trying to get uh, that high pitch sound, you know, that, you know, when you ricochet. And, uh, when you use the tapao on the bongos, which is a beautiful sound, pow, explosive, the same principle. You gotta bring this knuckle here, and then you lean in your hand like that, and you get that, that same sound, you know? You can do it like this, you can avoid this finger if you want to, for a different pitch, or you can use, but it's the, the sound is coming mostly from right here on the corner of this finger here. And this is called tapao, which comes from the, which means in Spanish covered, covered, but they slime it and they just say tapao, because it looks like you're covering something, see? 
almost like you're holding a nail. That's why when you play the uh, uh, the pattern on the uh, on the bongos, that is called a martillo, which means a hammer. It looks like you're holding a, a nail and you you're hammering. What are, what are some of the different slaps that you use on the congas besides that one to get different sounds? Well, there's uh, there's a flat one like this. a different sound, you know? I'm going to destroy that. Huh? That's a good one. Huh? Good question there. I always pick my uh, stool. This thing has some oil. And that's why they last me a long, long time. Okay. Yeah. You can produce a sound like this. Does it sound like this? You know? And the tapa, of course. I'm going to do a mordente. You guys know what a mordente means, right? That's the real terminology in music. It should not be called a flam. It should be called mordente. That's a mordente. Um, the same principle, the left hand seat, the knuckle, right inside. You know, you have to find your level, you know, you, you have to calculate and bring it in to get that sound. Now, in Cuban drumming, we use a lot of uh, uh, double strokes with the left hand and a single one, you know, like for example, like this. Sounds like you're doing it with both, but I actually do one and two. I'm getting used to this rim here, it's a little bit too high, but my friend, I want to fix this drum that was damaged by Katrina. He put the synthetic head, and uh, I wish this thing was a little bit lower. And I gotta watch out so I'm hit here. Uh, for example, like this is a, a rudiment on tune balladas that you do, and you use it on solo too. You do this. sounds that you can get you know I've seen guys doing this too you know you, you, you can do you know um, there's a lot of sound that you can do. it's amazing on one instrument but the hands are faster than the eyes it's very deceiving and it makes the instrument look simple and easy to play it's not it, it is a very difficult instrument to play same as all the other instruments are difficult because you know musicians always have some ego that no 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 the violin is the most difficult instrument, uh, the trumpet, the piano. No, man, if that was an easy instrument, we all play that instrument. It's just up to your taste, what you like the most, what you're more inclined with, so you choose whatever, you know. I like a lot of instruments, so I learned how to play tumbalo, timbalo, bong. used to play trumpet, took guitar lessons, you know. Um, piano, you, you name it, you know. And um, like uh, the question that Rick used, you know, you can get a lot of different sounds, you know. But we never call them slaps. No, we don't call them slap. Uh, because, you know, a slap would be more like, like that. You, you, don't, you don't slap the instrument. It's called tapao, and we call them like the flat, flat tapao, like this. You get that sound. Like when you do on a solo and you want to do different uh, uh, sound effects, you know. Let me give you guys one example of uh, what would you do on a solo. Or just to put a little uh, adornment, you know, it doesn't necesarily have to be a solo. But let's say you play a rhythm and you're doing this. That's one of the uh, uh, phrases that you learn, you know. And there's a lot of phrases that you learn for solos, you know. Like, for example, uh, this one here. And I can put more pounds, I can, go, I, can, I can do them like this. You know, like a multiple pounds on, on, on drums with a stick, you know, you get that sound, you can do it with your hands too. Um,
actually pitches coming out, and the, the, the intervals that he has in tune to are very important. Yeah, what's that dimension? It's next to your bell on top of the case. I'm glad you're here. You guys gotta excuse me if I'm a little absent-minded, but you want to play Cascada on top of Yeah, let's let's try that. You did very well. I knew you could do it. Let's do that one on cool thing I was telling you, huh? Okay. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was showing Rick something that I created myself. Nobody ever done that on the drum set. Playing uh, what you would do in a rumba ensemble on on the tuba orders. On the tuba order drums on a rumba ensemble, there is one guy or two guys playing a pattern. Like let's say the one on call, it's a very popular pattern. I mean a rhythm of rumbas. It's a rumba that is not slow, uh, it's not too fast, and it's it became a world uh, dance craze and style of playing, you know. And this is what the woman code sounds like. Three guys would be doing that. One guy would be doing this part here, which they would call it the the tumbalor part. They're all called tumbaladas, but in, in the musicology slang, they will say uh, tumbalor tres dos, which means three two, and the one that is high pitch, actually a real quinto is smaller than this. They will call it a quinto. That would be um, um, baritone. Uh, I mean baritone alto, uh, bass drum. Um, no baritone tenor alto. Basic, you know. So um, we're gonna do that, Rick. The, the, remember when I was showing you that, that, that part with the cascade yep. and the bass drum and the upbeat. In Cuban music, uh, we don't like to play downbeat. We play everything. Every everything in Cuban music, it's syncopated in every bar and counterpoint in every bar, and uh, it's very tasty, you know. It has to make you want to dance. When we want to play very complex music with a lot of chord changes, more than in jazz, then we play dance song music and dance song it. That's a, the kind of Cuban music that is not that well known, you know. But it, you you also dance to it, you know. I'll tell you later on. the same sound that you heard and uh, the guy that would be playing the, the tres dos part uh, he would be playing this part here simple like a, you know I'm gonna make it simple like a like a street player to get 
hear that? You hear that? So the, the, the two of them are playing that part. Then there's the guy that plays the uh, cajita musical. When they don't have timbales, they got this thing here that is like a, a, a poor man's version of the timbales. It, it's made of wood, and they incorporate a lot of bells and things. They call it cajita musical, which means little musical box. That's what it, it means. And, and it's made of wood, and uh, usually they prefer to get that wooden sound on the casca, but you can do it on the timbales too, you know. You can do it on the timbales. And uh, that has become uh, folklore in Cuba, you know, that a lot of people, they want to use the cajita musical. If you ever go to Cuba, or if you watch uh, Cuban uh, musicians, um, when they're playing rumba ensembles, you're going to see that wooden thing, you know, square. I think it's square. I haven't seen one in a long time. Uh, the ones I've seen, they, they were kind of square looking, and they got a lot of bells, a lot of stuff, you know, and, and you hear that sound, you know, the guy's going to be playing, you know, and you're going to hear that sound like this. You know? Now, when you have all the, all the, the instruments that you need to play a rumba, then the timbala player doesn't have to do none of that stuff to fill in the emptiness. All he's going to be doing is, he's going to use both hands, he's going to be playing this. Simple. That same pattern. Which is the one go caster that he'll be doing it like this. And now with the variations, he's gonna be doing stuff like this, based on the same pattern. They always tell you you gotta stay with the club, right? But some stylists in Cuba, they started playing the wall and co against the, that club. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of going and on club, it would be like this, right? They started going against it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go against it. So you can do it either way. Now you're gonna find sometimes some ignorant people that want to tell you, oh, 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 you gotta do it. No, it, it's correct to do it either way. I had a, a but collection. If you have more than one person playing the percussion section, the yeah. important thing is that whatever way you do it, everybody agrees. Yeah. And then they should know all the different styles that they are of doing it and the rules. You know, uh, I met this Cuban guy who is very famous. You know, and he argued with me that there was no requinto. And uh, that it was uh, the guy who uh, created the company uh, Latin Percussion, who started calling uh, one of the small timbalas requinto, and that uh, there was no such a thing as a requinto. And I said to him, hey man, how old are you? You're not a young guy, but I, I know I'm a, a lot older than you. And, he, and when he told me his age, I said, well, I'm about, uh, I think I was like, I think I am like 10 years older than him, maybe. I'm talking about uh, Changuito. Oh, okay. I said, Changuito, did you ever meet anybody in Cuba born in the uh, 1800s? No. I said, well, I have. I met people who were very healthy, who, you know, could borrow on you, you know, they have all their teeth. You know, those people grew up, you know, eating organic foods in Cuba. Almost everything, everything is grown organically. And so the, when you eat something that you just picked it off the ground, whether it's a fruit or a vegetable, you're going to be a healthier person. Your pH balance in your body is going to be, you know, you're not going to be acidic, you're going to be very healthy. And uh, I said, I seen in Cuban television, when I was a kid in Cuba, I saw a guy holding around his waist at Requinto. Small to mother. And he was a singer, a very good singer, and he was just playing the Requinto. And he was using it actually for timing. He was playing simple. He was going... He wasn't even playing a quinto or anything, you know. And um, he was like... I said, don't hide it because you know I can find that video. You know, I, I, it's in black and white. It was I saw it in the 50s, and and, and I, if you want to bet some money, you're gonna lose. And then he says, no, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> if you don't want to argue, just I was right. You know. So there's there's the requinto, and it was not created by LP and uh, anything like that. You know. Uh, I know that 
Ricky told me to come a little closer to him because I was too far. Oh, you're good, you're good, man. Yeah, you know, timbales, bongos, and tumbadoras, they, they count upon each other, you know. There's a rhythm that is it, it, not known outside Cuba because, because of the political situation, but uh, I intend to push it and, and make it a dance craze like mambo, which is also Cuban and cha-cha-cha. Uh, there's a rhythm called um, the piano and the bass, they counter uh, point each other, and it's not like the other sones. Sones is uh, what we call all the styles of music, whether it's a mambo, whether it's a pachanga, um, Walacha, you know, those are different styles of song music. There's no such a thing as salsa. Salsa is just a bullshit word, excuse my language. Uh, it's just a, a new label they put on something, you know, and uh, there is no cow belt. They're all bells. This bell here is known as the Montuno bell or Mambo bell. This one here, uh, it, the small one is the one that the uh, Charanga Orchestra is using in Cuba. They, that, that's the orchestra that uses uh, several violinists, a cello, an upright bass, you know, and uh, one guy on tumbales and one guy on timbales, and they play very pianissimo, very soft, you know, classical uh, style, you know, and uh, they use a little bell. So that bell was known as the Charanga bell. So you can call the small bell Charanga bell or the Cha 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 bell. Either way is correct. But don't call them cowbells because they're not. Cowbell is made of copper, it's got a rattler, it's just a different thing. You know, people always all the time say, hey, do you, uh, this bell right here, the real McCoy? Uh, I had a friend of mine who braced it, it somebody cracked it, somebody was sitting playing real loud. This is a bell made in Cuba, this is a real thing, but this is intended for bongos, for the bongo player. The bongo player plays. The bottom bell or the bass drum bell? I mean, uh, the bass bell. What am I saying? Now, timbales, uh, this ring that I was talking about, uh, pilon, uh, the pilon player, I'm going to make it very simple. He's doing this pattern. And more than that, but that's one of the main patterns. The guy on the tumbalota is going to count to him. When he goes, bam, 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 kakum. Every time he goes, ching, 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 kakum, kum, 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 kum. And then the bass, the bass player, he's not going to be playing a regular kum, 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 kum. No, he's, got a, he's playing a different pattern, um, uh, complex, and the piano too, you know, that's called pilon. The, the pilon, it's a, um, was created, Easy to learn, you know, so you can dance to it. And, and it, it, if it would have spread out of Cuba, it, it, it was created in the mid 60s in Cuba, you know, uh, it would have crossed a, a dance craze, same as, uh, as the mambo and the cha cha cha, or maybe even more, because it's simple to dance, very tasty, and, and that's the pilon rhythm. So, um, can I say one thing for a second? Yes. As far as the drum set is concerned, the, drum, the percussion instruments from Cuba were around a long time bef before the drum set was even invented. Okay, so all these rhythms from Cuba are, are quite old. And when the drum set was actually invented in the early 19th century, what drummers started doing from Cuba is they started to, since we play this instrument with four limbs, they started to take some of, as, as many of the rhythms from these other instruments and trying to play as many of the rhythms as they can on the drum set by themselves. So that's why uh, this, this one rhythm ball on Co, for example. This is one of the things that drum set players started to do from Cuba 30, 40 years ago, starting at least, maybe oh, 50. 
Well, it, it, it's still it's still very slow, you know. Uh, it's amazing what Ray can do. He's playing club with the left. I mean, with with the high hat with the left foot while he's doing all that. That is extremely difficult to do. You have to be very coordinated. Uh, Rick never ceases to amaze me how coordinated he is, and uh, the energy that he has when he plays for an old man, you know. <laughs> Not as old as you. Uh, <laughs> just a few years older than him, you know. I, I told Herman Riley on uh, that last gig we did uh, together after so many years at Snow Harbor. Uh, I said, Hurley, I was worried about you, man. Because, <laughs> you know, you don't know how you are inside, you know, and he was so much energy and he was doing so much that I said, man, I hope he doesn't get a heart attack, you know. Yeah, because, you know, he's not a young man anymore. Uh, Hurley is near uh, 60, you know. How old are you now? This keeps you in good shape. Yeah. Huh? This, this instrument keeps you in good shape. <laughs> yeah, but you, you never know, you know. And this too, you know, I mean, yeah. this is... Well, you know, when you play and you do things like this on this instrument, your heart, this is a cardiovascular workout. Bombos too, you know. Let me show you guys something. But man, it's amazing that Rick was doing that, you know. Uh, when I first started playing around with the uh, track drummers, it was a nightmare. These guys didn't know, shit, I'm trying to know, they didn't know anything. And it was a nightmare, you know. And it, it was very difficult to play with them. They wouldn't let me breathe. They were all over the place, you know. And, and they loved to fake it, you know. They didn't want to play a battle. Um, they wanted to do everything up here. And they didn't know anything, you know. So it, it took me a long time to be able to, you know, teach around. And I, I ran into guys who were intellectual, like Rick, uh, Johnny Bilakovich, Herlin Riley, you know, um, Chris Lackinac. Um, the last two track drummers that I taught learn, uh, they learn uh, quite a lot, you know what I mean? They, they can come and play a distant gig, you know, not very sophisticated, but they can play a distant gig on timbales now. And, uh, uh, do uh, stuff from Bombas and Tumbalas, you know. Uh, actually, one of them, he graduated here, uh, Gabriel, mm -hmm. Gabriel Velasco, uh, David Sobel, where did he graduate from? I don't know. Well, David Sobel, uh, I haven't seen him in a long time. Uh, I taught him Timbales and Bombas, and he was doing pretty good. He was doing pretty good. Uh, we used to play lots of gigs together. And uh, those are the uh, only two trap drummers that I was able to teach more, you know because uh, it's, it's always been, uh, uh, they always have an, um, you know, I'm too busy, I'm this, that. I wish that all the uh, trap drummers in the United States learn how to play timbales. Like in Cuba, in Cuba, you're a trap drummer, you have to know how to play timbales and you have to also go to all this, you know. And uh, because then you know where you're at, you know exactly when somebody wants to play whatever, you know, you, you give them room to breathe, you know. Rick and I, we did, uh, we done a lot of gigs together, but, uh, Remember when we played uh, Lafayette? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't have a name, and I said, how about the Babalu brothers, you know? And they drink, so oh, I like that. We played uh, that place over there. Uh, I don't remember the name of it. Uh, uh, Hermosphere? It was downtown, what was the name? <coughs> 721 or something? Something like remember? that, some number. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember calling it. Right, um, we played there, <laughs> and we freaked out everybody because uh, uh, Rick didn't want to do it, you know, Rick's over, uh, the, our passenger around, you know, like we do in New Orleans, to collect money, and the owners, they, they didn't like it too much, to say, hey, man, you know, uh, we're not making any money, you know, we, 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 we are making this for very little money, so we have to pass the jar around, you know, in New Orleans, everybody does it, and it, it's okay, but those people over there, they're too kick, you know, they, uh, <laughs> they didn't react too much to, the, uh, you know, to what we're doing, I mean, yeah, we got compliments and all that, but, uh, Everything over there was uh you know, rock music and stuff like that, you know. So I I started to hate that that, that town man. I said, man, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't stand it, you know. I, I did a gig over there and I brought the all and finest musicians to play there and almost nobody came. The back, it was packed. A band playing, ba, goom, goom, ba, goom, real loud, you know. And, and I said on the microphone, that's it, I don't ever want to play in this town again. I got really pissed off, you know. And the lady says, hey, uh, no, don't take it like that. There, there was people here who love your music, and, you know. And, you know, she, she was nice to me. I said, yeah, but no, nobody showed up. 
But you know, playing with guys like Ricky Sebastian is always a pleasure. You know, the Ricky is it, is gifted. You know, and uh, you know when I play with drummers like him, trap drummers like him, uh, Hurley Riley, Johnny Blackovich, etc., etc. You know, uh, uh, I can't remember all the other guys. You know, but I, I have shared knowledge. I didn't teach none of these guys how to play the drum set. You know, they were already accomplished drummers. I always say that because I don't want to misunderstand. It. The only thing I have taught them all is, you know, rhythms, stuff like that, so that, you know, we can play together. Let's demonstrate a little bit of that for yeah. us. Let's play so you can solo a little bit so you can see what you can do. Yeah, I want to do uh, repeat phrases so you guys see that, uh, that you know, uh, it's, it's real. It's a real language. It's like English, French, Italian, you know, you have to know the language. And uh, that's what you do. But you gotta be on time. You gotta be on time no matter what you do. Let's start with the, with the tumba Let's let's do like a like a little like a little jam, you know, almost like a mango. Huh? Song. Yeah, let's do a song. We can do a song. You live with the uh, alto or tenor drum, if you, depending on how you tune it and how many drums you have, you will live with this drum.
upbeat, you know, we just think of it in a real high. Basically, with two, songo would be like this. You know, like that, that's songo. When I switch to this, because I have four drums, then I can, I can do so much more, I, I was playing this pattern. Is playing on the end. I'm going to simplify it to four. Instead of two four, you know, Cuban music is two four. When you play the, the fast rhythm, I'm going to simplify it on four because it's easier to understand. This is the bass drum here. is played is played on the end. Don't play it on the four. This is four end. Four end. same space here as they would here on four. They will go like and they couldn't get it on the no that's on the and and three. Instead of playing two, you know, like boom boom, it plays one. It goes. Or you can do it like this. You can hold it like this. And then that sound is, it, it, he's going more or less this. Just for timing, okay? But you, you don't hear it. He plays it very soft. What you hear is the bell and the casket and whatever else. He's doing this on that space. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So he's doing it like this, with the fingernail, trying to get that. The bongo player is playing one note on that same space, but he, this is the counter. This is the one that counterpoints the most. Bongo player is doing this. Sounds like it looks like you're holding a nail. The old school, they play with a hand like this, and they, they do actually they do this. My technique, I do it like this. Sounds like very explosive. Uh, 
traditionally, uh, the other guys that do the double scroll like this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a simple so you guys get the idea. The knuckles here and the, uh, the first bend is what's hitting the, the skin. You're doing that. See? There's uh, different ways of doing it. This one here, I call it the uh, natural or the sloppy one. You don't have to uh, press, you don't have to put your hand in any position. You just place your hand like this, naturally like that, right? Your hand is going to be, it's not going to be like that, you know? Just place it like that and then just let the hand move up and down by itself. Don't do anything, nothing. Just let it go up and down and it's going to sound like this. The other one is the one like this, and, and uh, you can press on all of them, but uh, it's uh, the, on the sloppy one, when you try to press, then you lose that uh, natural. See, you let the hand by itself right in there. You get that sound, you know. The other one, like this, this is the one that made you the famous. You can press this one, uh, you can go like this. I created one that is like this. This is mine, uniquely mine, because I'm, I'm the guy who writes the new chapters. I do the same thing with the right hand. It sounds like this. It sounds like you're playing with sticks. On the bongos, it's even a, a, a more uh, defined sound. And the thing about the one I created, my own creation, is that it, it doesn't take that much space. You can do it in a very small space, you know, that you don't have that much range like you do here. Here you have a lot of space. On the bongos, it sounds like this. And I can alternate with the power every other. I'm going to give you a little example on the bongos uh, of language, vocabularies. I'm going to repeat each one of the phrases uh, three times so you guys get the idea. Same as you do on, on any instrument, no? not necessarily trap drums. And, and it's a language, it's a very complex language. Like this, uh, Ricky, play songo, but a little slower. Okay. okay. But, but with the casca. How, how fast you want it? Yeah, I want to.
do it again. Do it one more time. drum set like that, it, it's difficult to do. Yeah. If somebody else had been playing the drum set, it would have been, they would have fallen apart because I taught it to some other drummers. So, Ricky, you know. Yeah. 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 Ricky, any, any suggestions for any, anything? I'm a little spaced out. Uh, want to do something in 6 eight? Yeah, great. A lot of the tumba, a lot of players, they like to use um, stuff from the patat drum culture, you know, um, and it's okay. It's okay to do stuff like this, you know. But I, I'm going to show you now the orchestrator, the one that is for tumbadores, you know, created for tumbadores without having to do the other stuff from the other um, um, drums, you know, like the patat drums. The patat drums are the drums that you play like this, you know. And like, got, like, shaped like an hourglass. Yeah. Like kind of. And those are religious drums, you know. Uh, they use them, you know, in popular music too, but uh, uh, it, it's a religious drum for ceremonies and rituals and stuff like that, you know. And uh, a lot of people, uh, they think that uh, that the patel drum has more vocabularies and uh, bongos, timbales, and, and no, they don't. Uh, don't let them fool you. <laughs> they do not. 
it is complex what they do, of course, like everything else. You got to know, but they don't. They don't have more vocabularies. You know, they they do not. This thing has uh, uh, so much rudiments and so much vocabularies. You know that uh, sometimes I just run out of uh, repertoire. You know, I just I say, oh man, I could have done this one. I could have done that one. You know, let's do that on the sixth. Set, you do it with the, with the hi-hat and you get that 
Because I, I played with Colombo on the track drums in the past, and they would do it like that. And then on the uh, on the bass drum, they, they were playing uh, stuff like um, it would be more like. Uh, I've seen some of the guys when there was no tumbala player playing that on the bass drum, yeah. and then uh, at the hi hat here you would hear that you, you would hear that combination, you know, you would hear that together with that, and then you would play. I had to do it. Cool. I did it in Miami. I hated it. <laughs> I played gigs in Miami, which I had to play. Uh, a drum set and a tumbala on the right next to the hi hat. I had to play with my left hand like this. Imagine you're sitting down, and you're going. I'm sorry. You're going. And the hi hat. And the hi hat going. Then on the bass drum, I was going. <laughs> oh man, I hated it because I, they wanted a trio and sometimes two. I, I played with this Puerto Rican guy who didn't know any theory and he didn't know uh, how to. He always started everything with rubato. And I said, man, just come on the, down on the court, just go bang and stop playing the tune. No, he would always do a rubato and then I had to watch him and then, you know, catch him, whatever he was at. And he didn't, he didn't understand. You know, it was very hard for me to play. And uh, he was playing the bass. With this thing, I don't remember what they called it, that had these legs, looked like a uh, table legs, and, and it, it produced. What do they call that instrument anyway? What you ever seen it? He was playing with his feet, the bass. And he had legs like a uh, like wooden legs. Bass drum? No, it was a, a, a wooden drum. So. But he, he was completely. I used to tell, look, man, let me play the bass line on the bass drum. <laughs> don't do that anymore because it's making it worse. So I had to play. What the bass is doing? I was doing that on the bass drum, and it's, it's extremely uh, difficult to do that. Um, any questions? Yeah, we got about five minutes. About five minutes? On timbales, when you're gonna play a rhythm, I almost forget. You're gonna hear this. Okay, you go one, two, three. You catch it on the one, I mean on the three. You go, that rim shot, you go. That's a cha-cha-cha, you know, when you play quarter notes on every beat on the little bell, that's a cha-cha-cha. The bass is going to be playing, uh, the basic line on the cha-cha-cha, the bass is going to be You're doing this on the couch. You're going. Some guys don't like to play the couch. Some guys just play with the other hand and just going. They don't have to worry about any of this. Because you got the guy playing the two other, right? And uh, the piano is playing this pattern. You know, then they add some of the other uh, montunos into it, but that's that's that rhythm that it caused that dance craze all over the world. And cha cha cha, even to today, is, is the, the the biggest rhythm ever in the world. That caused uh, such a craze, you know. The people still come and hey, can you play a cha cha cha? You know, it, it was the most popular dance ever created. And it, it, it's not just one, two, cha cha cha, one, no, that's the, no, cha 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 has a lot of fancy stuff, you know. But people think it's only one, two, cha cha cha, back and forth and forward. No, man, they did a lot of stuff, you know. Um, they, they used to do stuff like this and like this. I knew. I was doing it when I was a kid, you know, in the, in the early 50s I was doing that, you know, because it was, and then they would do this one, that you come forward like this, and then you do it backwards, and you, you jump in, and then they would do that, like, side and side, 
it, it was a fancy dance, but all over the world people would just do one, two, cha, cha, cha. How would you do it on the drum set? I just play something like this. You want me to give you a bell? side only. Don't play bell on both sides because uh, you know it's, it's not a good technique. You want to keep the side that you hold smooth. So you play on one side, mark it, and that's the side for holding. On the on the uh, one of the main uh, rhythms on the on the hand bell is like this. You start right, the one you go. If you count on four, you go, you go. Is that on the two three? Mm -hmm. Two three. That actually you can do it on the two three. Now when you play real fast, imagine playing real fast going. What you do is you, you simplify it and you play. Every now and then you throw a little more, but you do this. If, uh, if we were playing, uh, for example, on this tempo. Unless you play with, with, with both hands, you know, with the two sticks on the... We can know how to play the pattern. We can do that on the, uh, the other pattern on the Roomba, the other one. It's very fast, and one guy on the tuba is playing this pattern. He's doing this. Clip that quarter note. I think it's coming from over here. You're playing backwards instead of going like you do with the other uh, rhythm. You're playing it backwards. So the guy playing here on the uh, tres dos would be this drum here, he would be playing this. clave here and use the bell that you can go like that you know you can do it like 
like that. And uh, like when I play uh, timbales and I'm playing uh, 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 on the bridge, I like to play the, uh, the what the cymbal is doing. I usually the bongo player is playing the bell and the timbala player is doing.